The 90s CD-ROM era birthed some of the most enigmatic titles in all of video games, from well-known adventures like Myst to the more surreal and uncanny worlds of Drowned God and Bad Day on the Midway, I love point-and-click games, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to make your own in Game Maker Studio. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you all the tools you'll need, how to capture your footage, and demonstrate some basic point-and-click code. In a future video, I'll go over some advanced things like making interactive locks. Quick disclaimer, this is by no means a comprehensive tutorial, and I'm sure there are better ways to do everything I'm about to show you. This is just how I like to do it. So why the hell use Game Maker for this? Isn't that like a 2D engine? Well, for the most part it is, but remember, Myst was made using HyperCard, basically just a slideshow of clickable images. Just like shooting on film grants a movie a certain look, using Game Maker effectively replicates the technical limitations and visual style of the era. So I like it. Let's get started. I'm using Game Maker Studio version 1.4 for this. Pretty sure you can use any version though. You also need a 3D modeling software. I use Blender, but if you want to get freaky with it, you could use a vintage software like Bryce 3D for highly aesthetic environments. All right, so the first step is to make the puzzles and environments. Of course, you don't need puzzles. It can be entirely experiential. But if you do, I highly recommend working this stuff out in advance. I generally come up with one level at a time, plan the whole thing out, then build it. The important thing is, if you do have puzzles, paper prototype them first. A puzzle is rarely fun and solvable the first time, and you'll save yourself a ton of frustration if you test on paper before putting it in game. Your paper prototype doesn't have to be pretty. It just needs to convey the information so when your friends test it out, they know what they're looking at. When designing a puzzle, I like to think about a unique environmental interaction to base it on, whether that's manipulating lights, moving statues, or turning gears, something that's fun for the player to click on and interact with. Next is concept art. Roughly sketch out the locations from the viewpoint of the player. I don't draw out every view, just enough to get a sense of how they'll fit together. Now that we have our puzzles and environments, it's time to model your scene. This isn't a modeling tutorial, there is way too much to cover there, but here's a couple tips. To easily set your camera view, line up the editor view to where you want it, then go to View, Align View, Set Active Camera to View. Pressing 0 on the numpad takes you into the camera view. You're going to want to map out how the player moves through the environment in advance. I call these camera viewpoints nodes. How many nodes you have depends on the complexity of the scene, but in general, you don't want too few or the jumps between locations will feel jarring, too many and the jumps will feel unimportant, plus you'll make a ton of extra work for yourself. To mark a node, once you have the camera view placed how you want it, press Ctrl A to add a small cube to the scene. Label it N, then a number, 1 being the starting view. Right click on the camera's origin and hit Shift S, cursor to select it. Then right click on the cube and hit Shift S, selection a cursor. That'll snap the node cube to the camera's origin point. Make sure to disable rendering for these cube objects so they don't show up in your final render. Now, even if you end up moving the camera to another view, you can always snap it back to the node in case you have to make adjustments or re-render a view. I like to call the scene renders my footage because the process is very similar to shooting pictures and clips for a movie. First, make a new folder for your project. This is going to be separate from the Game Maker folder. Inside, place two subfolders, static renders and animated renders. All the scenes or pieces that don't move will go into static, and all of the animated cutscenes or objects will go into animated. I like to keep all of my static backgrounds and folders sorted by the level. For animations, it's extremely important that each cutscene or animation has its own folder. Otherwise, when you go to Port the animation, Game Maker won't know which frame is the starting frame. Once you've got your view set up and your scene fully modeled and textured, it's time to render the static backgrounds. In the camera panel, you can adjust the focal length. I typically use 16 millimeter. In the scene panel, you can set your render engine. For most shots, I use cycles, but it does take a lot longer than Eevee. Next, to set your render output, the dimensions and format of the final image, go to Output Properties. Choose your output folder, either the static render folder for static backgrounds or the animated for animated cutscenes. Set the file type to PNG. For animated cutscenes, you'll also use PNGs so that it generates a PNG sequence that Game Maker can recognize as an animated sprite. The default image resolution is 1920 by 1080 however, you have a bit of a choice to make here. Setting the resolution to 100% will render a 1920 by 1080 picture, which gives you a much sharper image, but the file size will be larger, so you'll need to compress it later manually so as to not stress Game Maker's memory. If you set the resolution to 50%, you'll save memory and time, but you may lose some scene details, especially in darker environments. When capturing scene footage for important views like the center of this square, I usually capture all four sides, forward, backward, left, and right. 
For less important areas like an alleyway, I'll often just capture the Ford in reverse view to save render time. It's very important that you establish a naming structure for your images early on so that you'll be able to appropriately reference them later on in code. I usually pick a point in the world that I consider forward, and then all of my renders will either be labeled forward, left, right, or backward, depending on the view's orientation to that point. I'll also reference the node. So for example, in this club scene, I chose the neon sign as my forward orientation. Then I labeled each of the views captured for each node, N1 facing sign, or N1 left, N1 right, N1 back, so on and so forth for each node. Now that we have our scene footage, it's time to import it into Game Maker so we can turn it into something that resembles a 3D world. The three building blocks of our game will be sprites for animated elements, backgrounds for static scene views, and rooms, which will consist of backgrounds, clickable elements, and sometimes animations. To import an animation, create a sprite, click Load Sprite, navigate to your animated render folder, and find the subfolder with the correct animation. Click on the first frame of the animation, then Shift-click on the last frame to select all of them. Click Open. Game Maker will now begin importing your animation and will automatically recognize the PNG sequence as an animation so long as the file numbering is sequential. Finally, give the animation a name. I like to use SPR underscore anim and then write what's an animation of. To import our static scene views, go to Backgrounds, Create Background, and then select the background you want to load from Static Renders. I label these BK underscore, then the scene view. It's super important that you keep the naming structure of the backgrounds consistent with the room names Otherwise, you won't know which background goes to which room. Finally, create a new room, set the width and height to 960 by 540, name it the same as your background, but change BK to RM underscore, since this is going to be a room. Go to background, select your background, then bam, we've got a room with a background. But it doesn't really feel like a dynamic, explorable world right now, it's just a static background. So let's fix that. We're going to create a bunch of sprites. Create a 64 by 64 sprite, set the opacity to half, color it green, and label it SPR Zone Forward. We want to lower the opacity of all these sprites so they don't completely obscure our scene view. Create another, color it blue, and call it SPR Zone Turn Right. Create another one, color it pink, and call it SPR Zone Turn Left. Create yet another, color it red, draw some text that says examine in the middle, and name it SPR Zone Examine. Now make a final one, color it a lighter shade of green, add some text that says clickable, and name it SPR Zone Clickable. We'll use all these zones to set up interactions in our pseudo 3D world. The colors are somewhat arbitrary, I just tend to use ones that visually make sense to me. However, if you have difficulty registering certain colors, you might want to consider using shapes, lines, or dots to differentiate your zones instead. Create a new object for each of these zone sprites you just made and label them the same, but swap SPR underscore for OBJ underscore. Open up the room you made, grab your turn right zone object and shift left click to add it to the room. With shift held, grab the handle and drag it to extend it to the size you want, then place it to the left of the screen. Do the same with the turn right zone. Finally, do the same with the forward zone, but place it somewhere in the center near where the player would have to click to move forward to the next area. This is how we set up clickable areas on our screen that will turn the view left or right let us move forward and inter interact with objects that can be clicked on or examined. Of course, you can have special zones that better fit the mechanics of your game. These are just the ones I usually need. Now, let's make these zones do something. Go ahead and create a few more rooms to cover turning left and right, and maybe one for when we click forward to the next area. Open our zone forward object and add a left mouse released event. Throw in an execute code block. Since the same zone objects will be used to navigate us to every area of the game, it's super important that you keep this code organized and labeled by level and area. Type if room equals your starting room, room go to, parentheses the room you want to move the player forward to. This same code structure will be repeated for each of the zone objects, taking you to different rooms when you click on them. Cool, now we have zones in our rooms that, when clicked on, move us left, right, and forward. Each room has a different background, so it looks like we're rotating in 3D space. One last touch before we go ahead and run our game. In global game settings, uncheck display the cursor, create a new object, obj underscore cursor, make a bunch of different cursor sprites for contextual interactions, like an arrow pointing left for when you turn left, a forward arrow for when you can move forward, and the step event of your cursor object, throw in a code block, Type x equals mouse underscore x and y equals mouse underscore y. On a new line, write if place meeting, parentheses x, y, obj, zone forward, brackets, sprite index equals spr, the cursor sprite that shows the forward arrow, and brackets. Go ahead and do the same for when the cursor is meeting zone right, left, so on and so forth. Place this cursor object somewhere in the first room. Now go ahead and run the game. When you move the cursor over to the correct place on screen, it will change styles, indicating an interaction. And when you click, 
voila, it feels like we're navigating a 3D world, mist, point and click style. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video and you want to see more point and click stuff, feel free to follow me on Twitter at UncannyValerie. Be sure to check out my itch page in the description. I've got two mist likes there made using the same techniques shown in this video to give you an idea of what's possible. In a future video, I'll go into some advanced stuff like making interactive locks, panoramas, and animated interactions. But for now, have fun creating.